So welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. We're starting a new topic today, which is transmission lines, or in other words, how wires can behave at circuit elements when frequencies get high. So let's jump right into this. And even though it's pretty mathematical, we'll, we'll skip over much of the math you can look up later in books. So let's take a very simple circuit, something like a voltage divider with two resistors here. Um, at DC frequencies, it's pretty easy to understand if I ask you to say, what's the voltage um, and current in the circuit as a function of position? Well, first of all, we define a ground right here, so we know the voltage is zero at that point because that's the definition of ground. And then we can draw something that looks like this. Going into the first resistor, the voltage is whatever is from the source. As it goes through the resistor, we would kind of expect that voltage to drop down by some amount. Uh, similarly, along a wire, it stays constant. It drops down in the resistor to zero because at this point of the circuit, it's defined to be ground. And the current, I, which is given by the red line here, um, is constant. The, the current is the same as it goes through the circuit. That's pretty straightforward. But what happens if we replace this DC source with an AC source? Um, and an AC source in which the, the wavelength of that is actually pretty short. It's on the size of the resistors. Um, let's take a look at what that voltage might look like. Well, what does Ohm's law mean when you have um, essentially the, vo the voltage varying across a resistor? And in some ways, the voltage might be the same at both sides of the resistor, although maybe we'd expect it to decrease. Similarly, you have voltage zero coming into that resistor for a particular point of the wave, but if we move the resistor in the circuit, uh, then we get more of what we expect. So it's, it's pretty clear that while we're not going to solve this qualitatively, this idea of things not behaving the same when you get to high frequencies in circuits is pretty important, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. So a resistor is about one centimeter, and the wavelength of one centimeter we can solve pretty straightforwardly from the stuff we knew about waves. It's simply the, the speed um, the wave would move, which we're going to estimate to be about the speed of light, divided by the frequency. And the frequency in this case is about 30 gigahertz, much higher than you would ever use in a laboratory. So most of the time you don't have to worry about this uh, because you're operating at frequencies that are orders of magnitude smaller. But at some points you do start to work with high frequencies, and these things become important. So it turns out actually that the largest circuit elements you work with typically are wires. And in electromagnetics, the, the, what we're talking about in this lecture series, we call these transmission lines instead of wires. And there's a difference between a wire and a transmission line. We use wires a lot in our labs and things like that. But a, tr a wire can bend everywhere. It connects point A to point B in the circuit. But when we use the word transmission line, we're talking about some kind of conducting structure that has symmetry, consistency, so along its length it's the same, and you have two conductors of some type separated by an insulator. So this is what we mean by wires. This is your typical breadboard, and you have little insulated wires you plug in, and they go everywhere. And they're not symmetric. They're not consistent because they're not the same. Um, something like a coaxial cable where you have a center conductor uh, 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 surrounded by a ring of insulating material than an outer conductor, both has symmetry and consistency. Similarly, two wires spaced an equidistance apart um, have symmetry and consistency. Even something like the twisted pair for Ethernet can be treated as a transmission line. And this coaxial cable, for example, this is what it looks like. You use this all the time in your lab. Um, this is the standard BNC, or Berkeley Nucleonics Corporation is where that came from, uh, BNC cable, which is a coaxial transmission line. And it turns out that there are, there are analytic solutions, or in other words, use the word nice math equations, although looking at them you may not think they're quite so nice. Um, but there are actually solvable math equations for many types of these transmission lines, but we can't write math equations, at least in analytic forms, for asymmetric and inconsistent shapes. You have to uh, resort to the indignity of computer simulations to describe those. <coughs> so, so why is a wire or transmission line a circuit element? And that's really the, the focus of this talk. Um, let's take a look at a, a common device. And you see you have two parallel metal plates with some connectors on it. Um, and what happens if you actually shrink the size of those plates? And of course you recognize this as a capacitor. Well, that, that's still a capacitor. That's still a capacitor. But in the limit that the width of the plates goes to zero, it goes from being a capacitor to being actually a two-wire transmission line. 
essentially. So you'd put a signal in there and get it off here, and you can ignore those, those little things sticking up for the time being. So this becomes a pair of wires. The question to ask is, when exactly did it stop becoming a capacitor? Um, and the answer is it didn't. It just got less and less capacitor-like as we shrunk the size of those plates. So a pair of wires, in a way, does act like a capacitor, just not a very good one. Um, similarly, let's take another common um, passive circuit device, the inductor, and we represent an inductor with this symbol right here, just as we use that schematic diagram to represent a capacitor. And you probably know that, that these schematic diagrams look like what they are. A capacitor looks like two parallel plates, and an inductor looks like a coil of wire, because that's what inductors are. Well, let's do the experiment. We take one end of this wire and we stretch it out. Well, it's pretty obvious that that's still an inductor but it's less inductor-like. If you stretch it still further, so you've got almost all the kinks out of it, it's even less inductor-like. And if you stretch it into a straight wire, it actually still has inductance. It's just not a very good inductor anymore. Um, so what do we know? That any wire can act like an inductor. Any two wires can act like a capacitor. It turns out that a single wire also has capacitance, but we'll learn about that later. And so what we want to know is when does this matter? When do we need to treat wires like inductors and pairs of wires like capacitors? And, and how do we deal with it? And is that dealing with it in a way that we can actually do calculations where the math starts to crop up? And that's what we're going to get into next. So to review, this is not a transmission line. This is just a mess of wires. This is a transmission line because it is symmetric, at least in a cylindrical dimension, and it's consistent along its length. This is also a transmission line because it's consistent across its length and its geometry doesn't change. This doesn't quite look so consistent, but if you were to look inside here, you'd find that the, the, you can create these things into cables that are flexible. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one length of a wire. Let's call it delta Z. And we know this wire has some resistance and some inductance. We don't know what they are but we know it has resistance inductance along its length delta z. If we put a second wire there, we know that there's some resistance and capacitance between the wire, and, and we know the resistance of the wire comes up because no metals are perfect conductor. This resistance comes up because no insulators are perfect insulators, and so maybe a few electrons or a little bit of current can sort of flow its way along the length, and that can act like a resistor. This resistor is very, very small because metals are good conductors. And this resistance is usually very, very high because most insulators aren't very good conductors of electricity. It turns out that standard 24 gauge wire has a resistance of about 0.08 ohms per meter, which you can ignore for reasonable lengths when you deal in the laboratory. So you don't treat it like resistors. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to say some length of transmission line, delta Z here, has some resistance per unit length, some inductance per unit length. So the, the units of this are not Henry's. They're Henry's per meter times the length delta Z in meters to get Henry's. Similarly, this is farads per meter and ohms per meter. And so we represent a small piece of the transmission line as the circuit. It's a four-element circuit. It's passive. You can solve it. It's tedious, but, but you can do it. You've all been trained to do that as electrical engineers. Um, we're going to make one change in this circuit, though, because we know that it's when you have two resistors or two um, circuit elements in series, they're pretty nice to deal with. Um, when you have them in parallel, you start to get this, this, these terms in the denominator. And that makes things a little bit more difficult algebra-wise to deal with. Um, we also know that we have something called the conductance, which is 1 over the resistance. And R resists electricity, G the conductance, just how good of a conductor it is. And we also know that when we have two conductors in parallel, we can write the G's in series. Um, because, well, heck, do the math yourself. That's pretty straightforward. So what we're going to do right here is instead of calling this a resistance, we're going to call this some conductance G per, per unit length. So we have four parameters of our little circuit, the resistance of the wire, the inductance of the wire, the capacitance between the wires, and the conductance between the wires. R, L, C, and G are the four circuit elements we use to describe a cable. And again, R is in ohms per meter, L is in Henry's per meter, and so on and so forth. And if you want to know the total resistance or 
inductance of a length of wire, you multiply the total length by uh, the total um, resistance per meter by the number of meters to get that.